Yeah. Hashtag. Um, Are meat pies good? I got to stop talking. All right, so let's yeah. see. Clear cutting, part B. We already went over this, but let's go back there really quickly because this was one of the first things we talked about. And I'm sure y'all weren't paying attention. Um, or you probably lost some brain cells between then and now. So let's make sure you got this. Clear cutting. What is clear cutting? Cut all the trees. What's it called when you just get a few of them, the bigger ones or older ones? Selective cutting. Good. So clear cutting can result in soil erosion. Why? Yeah, there's nothing there, and the, trees and roots and stuff are are not alive to hold things in place. And like on page 270 here at the top, um, when you remove those trees, you remove the ability to hold that soil and nutrients in place. No windbreaker. Mm, yes, no windbreaker. Um, economically, clear cutting. The benefits are you get lots of money up front. Um, the the con would be um, you, it's going to take a long time for those forests to recover and get more money. Um, if you wanted to continue to supply, I suppose you could clear cut small areas or you would want to um, thin or selective cut. When you guys, let's say, um, Rachel, you bought a plot of land in South Alabama and you were, you know, um, you, you had some trees on it. So you went in and clear cut that area. How old are you? What, 16 now? No. So um, it would take about 32 years if right after you planted that land for it to grow back to where you could cut it for like big lumber that you could sell that's used in houses and stuff. So you'd be 48 before you got that lumber money. Now you would, here's what would happen though. So you clear cut an area and I have to, you just have to do this. Like we would go in and my dad would get these odd jobs when I was growing up doing all kind of random stuff, fixing fences and um, plant trees. So you plant trees in the winter time so like during Christmas break, we would plant trees for people where they just had a clear cut. And so you have to take this like shovel looking thing, stab it in the ground, move it back and forth, put the tree in there, pull it up a little bit so the roots are facing down or otherwise it won't grow. And then put the shovel in beside it in the ground and, and close up the hole and then walk three steps and go to the next one. So if you're ever driving down the road and you see those like pine trees in really nice neat rows all the way out through there, um, those are part of the tree farm where people have planted. Um, somebody cut the trees, they came in and replanted. Now, once you replant, Rachel, on your area of land, in about 10 years, like you would take out about every third row. So take out a row, leave a couple rows, take out a row. And so what's gonna happen then is you're opening that up so those other rows can grow bigger and faster. And then the row that you take out, what can you sell it for? Because a 10 year old tree is maybe like that big. It's not very big. Maybe it's a little bit bigger, but you're still not, you're not cutting it for lumber. Not pine trees usually like we do around. Pulp, pulp and paper, yeah. So pulp would go toward like making paper or um, cardboard and stuff like that. And so you would sell it for that, which doesn't get as much money, but you can still get stuff out of it. And it's used for, goods that we need. And then in another roughly 10 years or so, you could come back and cut that other row. Um, and so you're basically leaving like one out of every three. And then that last row that you leave, those trees are gonna go big and they're gonna go fast. And um, hopefully by the their time they're about 32 years old, I think's the number, um, they should be big enough where you can cut them for um, like big lumber trees. So. But it takes a while. That's not something that you're pulling a lot of money off of every year unless Jordan owns, you know, 1,600 acres and every year she's cutting 50 acres and then that way she has a continuous supply of money coming in and she's managing that land. Um, and most people don't have 1,600 acres. So um, it's hard to manage land, but if you're going to, if you have land, um, I mean, why let it go to waste when you can use it for profit? You know, maybe by the time if uh, Rachel does that, if she's 48, and then she does it one more time, by the time she's 80, that's her retirement fund. Boom. Day. Then you can retire at 80. What'd you say? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> it sounded inappropriate. Think about that. Soil and stream temperatures. Don't worry about that, Donovan. It'll happen when it happens. Um, soil and stream temperatures do what when you clear cut? Increase dramatically, good, because there's nothing uh, there, or there's no, yeah, no shade there helping to um, lighten the load of the sun. Flooding, what happens when you clear cut? 
Increase. Flooding increases because you don't have trees there to help absorb water like a sponge, and so it causes flooding. Forests absorb pollutants and CO2. When you cut forests, they don't absorb pollutants. They don't absorb CO2. CO2, there's nothing to take the CO2 in, so you're increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, which then does what? Kills me. What makes it, yeah. So cl climate change is an issue that we talked about. It's one of those things that's kind of a very slow moving grind where you only have like small increments of change over the course of decades, which for most of us and people that are short-sighted are like, well, it's not affecting me, so what do I care? Well, maybe it affects your grandkids or their grandkids. So um, I think one thing that you'll see in the video, the people that are destroying the rainforest, they're doing it, well, what makes the world go around? money and power and so they're doing it for money and power and they're very short-sighted in what they're um, thinking about and, and how they're conducting their activities so these are things you guys need to consider as you get older and make sure we all buffer against that need for money and power not that everybody doesn't like money and power that's why i teach school it's so money and powerful okay y'all saw through that um part q let's go all right, I, I don't know why they put deforestation right there or clear cutting on part B and then on part Q they put sustainable forestry. Why not put them together? That would have made more sense. They is in the college board. So this order of, of topics and things that are under these topics is how they're outlined in the college board binder that I got and how they the order they have on like the quiz the sections you know that I give y'all quizzes on um I, I don't know why they did them in this particular order I mean the, they try to do it in like using resources and sustainability all at once but I would have done all the forestry stuff and then talked about sustainability while we're talking about forestry the same thing with like fishing and aquacultures and stuff so um I mean, as long as y'all get it, you get it. I don't know why they did that anyway. Um, sustainable forestry. What is the goal of sustainable forestry, Luke? Um, to make sure that you have more trees to cut down in your area. Like, cut trees down in a way where you can use them later. Like yes, so you continually have trees going toward the future because if we go and cut all the forest down in Alabama now, then there's not gonna be, there's gonna be a long time before we can grow back those trees and get ones we need. And as you've noticed, if you drive around here much off of Old Marion or across the, well, not really across the road, definitely off Old Marion, um, and drive throughout, especially go down toward Mountville, um, and drive around, there's a lot of new houses going up. And if you see a house going up before all the stuff goes on the outside, what's it made of? It's mostly made of wood. The skeleton the structure of it and so we need this constant supply of wood in order to make homes buildings um paper cardboard of all those amazon boxes you get when you order stuff offline aiden so um we need this constant supply of paper so we have to be diligent about how we you know how we manage our forest now in alabama we've got i don't know if you want to call this a problem only about 5% of the land in Alabama is, is publicly owned. So like national forests, we do have a few national forests that are publicly owned. And they do manage those for um, lumber, lumber needs. Usually they're waiting to cut those for lumber. Um, but the other 95% is privately owned land in Alabama. And um, so we're kind of dependent upon the individuals making good decisions in how they manage their land, um, how they um, look at their forestry resources and use those wisely. So um, that's something we have to consider. And, you know, Alabama is a pretty low government state, meaning like, you know, less government's better for most people around here. And um, so they don't want a lot of government intervention. But with that requires a certain amount of responsibility um, to make sure you're doing things the right way, that you're not over harvesting, that you're not polluting water, you're leaving areas of land around where you cut, which you're supposed to do. Um, now I contrast that with my wife's stepfather 
lives up in, or used to be from Massachusetts, and like he lives in a town um, where if there's a tree on close to the sidewalk or close to the road, you have to like go before the town council before you could cut that tree down because the town considers that tree part of the town. So it really depends on where you are and how much government control there is as to, to how you use your property and what you, you know, what you use it for and how you use it and what you can get off of it. So um, a lot of that has to do with your politics and who you want to have power and who you want regulating those things. Anyway, enough politics for the day. Uh -huh. How do we mitigate deforestation? What does mitigate mean? It's a very important term to know. Um, you're thinking of litigate. Control. Um, nope. Lesson. Sort of. Mm. Mitigate means to offset the cost. Oh. So if we have cost associated with deforestation, then how would we offset those costs? We have environmental costs, that kind of thing. How do we offset those environmental costs? What? Re replant. So the next thing in here is reforestation. So if you're cutting down trees, like you see on page 270 at the top there, Quinte, you see that hillside's cut down. It's going to cause erosion. You're going to, you've lost all your biodiversity in that area of the forest. What can you do to regain that? Well, the quickest thing you could do is replant, replant the trees. Have somebody come in and replant trees there. Um, and hopefully then animals and things that lived in other areas of the forest across the road will eventually find their way into that newly forested area. So that's the best way to mitigate an area that's been destructed by um, deforestation. Now, I will say this about out west. If you ever get a chance to go, um, I highly recommend going to like close to San Francisco or Northern California or Sequoia National Park, somewhere where they've got like the largest trees in the world, like the redwoods are the tallest trees. It's off the coast of, right along the coast of um, Northern California, right before you go into Oregon. So the redwoods are there, they're right along the coast. Um, and it's pretty spectacular to see a tree that's 300 and something feet tall, or and that's, you know, 10, 15 feet in diameter, something that we couldn't really imagine being around here. Um, most of our trees that you see around here, even big oak trees, um, that we have, or poplar trees, are maybe 80 feet at most. So imagine a 300-foot tree or a 330-foot tree, and one that's, you know, where a lot of our big trees around here, like the one by the softball fields, maybe a few feet wide. Imagine one that's 15 feet wide. So um, it's very different. It's amazing to see. And um, the problem there is if you cut down those trees, what's going to happen? Or what's not going to happen? They're not going to grow back very quick. Not very easily or very quick, yeah. So a lot of those trees are 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 years old. And so it's a little bit different. Um, you have to think about how you're, you're foresting and replanting those areas. Um, so a lot of those native redwood forests have already been cut down, but, and so most of the other areas hopefully have been protected where we kind of limit that, that deforestation in some of those big redwoods. Let's see here. Um, how do we mitigate deforestation? Using and buying lumber from sustainable forests. So you're gonna see in the video, in the rainforest video, if you're, Andrew, you get married in 10 years, and you're, you and your wife go to Lowe's or Home Depot, and you're picking out wood flooring for your home, and like, let's, let's just redo our bathrooms, and our living rooms, and our kitchens, and all this stuff. You know what I'm talking about. And so, you go and you are just in love with the Brazilian cherry that they have at Lowe's. Well, if you buy all that Brazilian cherry, what are you contributing to? The people in Brazil cutting down all the Yeah, the people in Brazil cutting down trees. So um, I'm not saying that we should try to hinder their economy, but if you're if you know trees are that are coming from the rainforest and you're using them, then you're contributing to that demand, which is going to cause them to cut down more. Um, where, you know, you might make the smart decision, Andrew, and be like, you know what? I like that Brazilian cherry. But that bamboo over there, that bamboo flooring they made, that's a renewable resource. Bamboo go, regrows very quickly. Um, it's a good, it's a good, valuable, you know, renewable energy source, a resource and used for a lot of number, different things. 
and it's not negatively impacting you know people in different parts of the world especially in poor areas i think i'm going to go with that see how you made a responsible decision there andrew keep that in mind okay so the decisions you make at stores places where you spend your money things you spend your money on these are how you make your these are how you vote your um concerns of what's going on throughout the world okay i know most of you will not go to the amazon and petition and pick it or you'd probably be afraid of getting shot like the people in the video um but you can petition and contribute by what you buy all right next thing reusing wood so for example at tractor supply um, before they changed management they used to let me come by and get all the pallets i wanted to that's out back there by tractor supply i got in trouble the other day anyway <laughs> Um, I didn't know they changed management and changed the rules, but um, before then I'd got some bunch of pallets and if you notice in our chicken coop out in the courtyard, I made that chicken coop out of pallets. So I took basically one, two, three, four, five, five, six, probably six pallets to put around the outside and then also took boards off of to kind of fill in the gaps in between where the pallet, you know, the holes in the pallets are. So that's an example of reusing a wood that they would have reused until the board started falling off and then they would have just thrown it away. So I was able to use reuse that uh, older pallets that they had, um, reuse it for something good. Until now. What? I said until now. You took a nap? I said until now. Oh, until now, yes. <laughs> well, and the, then the chickens will continue to use it. Um, other examples of reusing wood, like some people... I'm on this Facebook group where it's on like all wood heating stuff because I have a, a wood heater in my home and that's my primary source of uh, energy. And so um, a lot of people on there will go and like where there's old lumber that people can no longer use that they are they're getting rid of out of like they tore down a home. They'll just chop it up and that's what they'll burn in their, their wood stove. So anything like that where you can reduce the amount of wood, you're, you're helping out. Um, the next thing, integrated pest manage management to remove diseased trees. So when you have a tree farm like we talked about, where you have rows of trees, all of the same type of tree, densely populated in the same area, what are you likely to have? Disease, Disease or pest. Anytime where you have a lot of the same thing in a small area, you're going to have more parasitism, disease, overcrowding, stress, these type of density um, dependent issues. And for example, so what do most people in Alabama plant for tree farms? Pine. pine trees. So they're usually loblolly pine trees. Is the most common one, grows the fastest, but it's very prone to being attacked by pine beetles. Pine beetles get in, they bore little holes, they do it all over, and eventually they do it to the point where they kill the tree. Um, and once they do it in one tree, then they'll go to another tree, and then they'll go to another tree. So how would you go about managing that situation? All the beetles. Mm -hmm. Well, they do sometimes spray around the trees that are that do have beetles, and then what would be the other step? Find a natural Maybe I don't know if there's too many natural predators. Basically, what they do is they'll go in and they'll mark the trees and trees around them that are um, that have these infestations, and they'll remove them. So, in an attempt to go ahead and get rid of that, they can use that for pulp wood, or if they're big enough, they can use it for lumber. Um, and then you're reducing your risk of the trees around it. So that's really the best, the only way that you can go about getting those diseased trees out. It's like quarantining kids. It is like quarantining, quarantining kids. Very good. Good job. All right. Except we won't chop anybody down. All right. Prescribed burns, 270 at the bottom. Why do, why would you want to burn a forest? To get rid of all the, like, small stuff. Okay. Um, well, that's not really the, what prescribed burns. That's like more slash and burn to get to clear land. Why do you want to get rid of the underbrush and stuff, Colby? To make room for whatever you want to regrow. Mm, no, not really. Not, that's not really the purpose of prescribed burn. Yeah. Yeah, so um, last period was a little bit confused because um, I asked about this and a girl said to prevent fires. And so it's kind of counterintuitive to think, well, you're going to burn it to prevent fires. 
If you've seen any of these large fires like out west or in Colorado and California and places like that, these are massive wildfires that are like, they blow, once they blow up, it's like they're, like you see this picture in Yellowstone here. This is a massive fire that's really tall, that's burning everything in its path, going to kill all those trees. A lot of trees can survive fi like small fires. So like a lot of trees we have around here, like uh, longleaf pine trees, which is native to Alabama and used to occupy like a large portion of Southern Alabama before the um, <clears throat> settlers got here. Um, they could handle small wildfires. Um, and actually it was quite common to have um, underbrush fires to clear out the understory. So basically when you have leaves and debris and stuff build up in the forest, like if you let it continue to build up and build up and build up, and every time there's a small little fire that breaks out, you put it out and it builds up and builds up and builds up. What happens if it gets real dry and it's real windy and a fire a fire breaks up? It's gonna spread. You're gonna have a big spreading large fire that's gonna kill a lot of the animals and plants in that forest. Whereas if you go in when it's just a little bit you can set a fire and it will burn back that underbrush and stuff and it'll prevent bigger fires in the future. My brother works for the Forest Service and this is kind of a controversial topic between environmental groups and stuff. But basically what he does is in the National Forest, they'll mark off an area, they go in with a bulldozer and bulldoze around it to create a fire line. And um, then they'll set fires all on the outside. Why do they set them on the outside? Yeah, so it's all gonna burn in and they'll burn away that underbrush. And the, and the part of it is to, they're managing the forest and getting rid of that so to help the trees grow. Um, but they're doing it for the most part to prevent larger fires in the future. And this is kind of a, uh, a very controversial topic out West because um, a lot of people, especially environmental groups, don't want them doing prescribed burns. The leaf litter builds up and it builds up to a point where when there's a fire that breaks out, it just burns everything down. You got thousands and thousands of acres. And so there's a lot of controversy over those forest management techniques. What should be done? What's the best practice? Yeah, Jeremiah. I remember when we were watching a presidential debate, one of the candidates was talking about cleaning up the forest so that it didn't burn everything. Is that what they were talking about? Um, well, that's probably part of forest management. When you have a lot of dead trees that are down, if you are, if you allow loggers to come in and like remove dead trees or diseased trees, then you're reducing that fire load off the forest floor. So that could potentially reduce the amount of fires that take place out west. Yeah. The, the bigger problem though that they have, Jeremiah, that we don't is you've got large areas of land, it's much drier than it is here, and it's much more hilly and mountainous. So it's not as easy as just clearing off an area and, and setting a, a small, you know, um, like a prescribed berm than it is here. So I think there's a lot more about removing underbrush and things like that that has to go into place to reducing the fuel load um, that causes those massive wildfires. So, um, a lot of places out west, it's very much just a hands-off, whatever happens, happens. And that's not seemed to work out well for a lot of locations. Um, some people want to blame it almost all on climate change. There's been wildfires going on throughout this country before people got here and before people were burning fossil fuels. Now, is it exacerbated by a drier climate? Maybe. But those fires have been going on for a long time. Just like in Alabama, there used to be fires all the time. And it, in fact, so much um, like south of here in the Black Belt region, we used to have elk and bison that lived on like areas that were like open plains because there was enough fires to kind of keep back the trees and stuff from growing. So it was essentially like a little grassland prairie area south of where we live. Imagine like, you know, bison running around and elk out there eating stuff. So, um, and basically, when people came in, anytime a fire broke out, they put it out. And so they cleared off a lot of land too for farming. And so you've, you've eliminated that, that element of the ecosystem that helped to burn back part of the brush and undergrowth. So we have, we have definitely altered the system we live in. All right. We're recording here. So just, <clears throat> um, Europeans prescribed burns pros and cons. So 
Um, I've already given you a bunch of pros and cons there. On 271, um, has anybody in here been to Yellowstone? I tried to get a field trip to Yellowstone a couple years ago, and <clears throat> somebody at the central office wouldn't approve of it. But uh, I actually had, like, hotels reserved, and I had a uh, flight sorted out and a bus, and uh, we were going to do, like, a four-day trip to Yellowstone. But anyway, who knows who makes decisions around here. And so Yellowstone, when I went, we went a couple years ago with my kids out there. And um, But I went when I was young, when I, early 90s with my parents. And we had went after this huge wildfire of 1988 that really burned about half the park down. Yellowstone's their, our kind of most um, famous, the oldest national park in the United States. It's a very, very large national park. And when we went, I mean, it was like a charred landscape even a few years later. Now, some animals were back and things were there, but it was very um, sparse compared to what it was. Imagine just like half of it was gone. So, um, and then when we went back a couple years ago, it was a very different landscape. All those areas that were burned were, were like in thick trees that had grown up, smaller trees. And you really couldn't see much of anything. I was surprised how much it had grown up since that point. So, fire can definitely has a big impact on an ecosystem, okay? So, think about those pros, think about those cons. That was an FRQ one year. Um, how would sh how we should manage the land that we live on. Some people think, you know, we have, um, in North Alabama, I grew up close to Sipsy Wilderness. This is usually where we go camping. And it's 25,000 acres. So it's a very large area. Um, and which would be about, hold on, uh, 40 square miles-ish. And... That area, if it's designated a wilderness area, you cannot have any motorized vehicle. You can't really do anything inside of it. It's pretty much hands-off. People can go in and camp. They can ride horses, but that's about it. So they had some wildfires there a couple years ago. And so, like, my brother was complaining, like, well, they don't let us do prescribed burns. They had a big wildfire that, out, that broke out because of, like, down trees and stuff like that that were left. So um, the policies and how we manage the forest does have an impact on them. And some people would argue, well, that would how it would be before people came here. So if it built up and then there was a big fire, then, then let it burn. So um, there's a lot of controversy over how we manage those resources. Okay? All right. So in the video, I want you to keep out your notes, and I want you to think about these topics. You're going to see a lot of people with different viewpoints on the Amazon rainforest. Um, the significance of the Amazon is it's such a, it's one of those things like when you get rid of it, it's never you're never getting it back, and it has a significant impact on other parts of the world. It, it's estimated or was estimated at one point that like half the half the living organisms on the planet, like individual species, not t by total, but half the different species on the planet were in the Amazon River Basin, that area that drains into the Amazon, and so. Um, I think they said roughly 17% has been cut down so far. Um, and the worry is once you get up, what point do you have to get up to to really change the climate there? Because 50% of the rainfall comes from what? The trees. The, the, the trees, the trans transpiration of the trees. So if you remove most of the trees, that's going to affect the amount of precipitation that falls. So it's going to affect its ability to be a rainforest and what's able to grow there and live there. So, um, and like you can see, there's there's a lot of controversy with this, you know, struggle for money and power within this area that's still kind of a developing place. 